What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to the channel. My name is Michael, and hope you are having an awesome day. So we got some more Sabaton history. Woo! Man. Once again, you know, every time I watch a Sabaton video, it's as simple as this. I get to listen to good music, and I'm learning. I'm expanding my knowledge on historical elements. And guess what? I'm getting a hopefully unbiased perspective of history. A lot of the songs that I have heard already in the history histories that I have reacted to and listened to brought up different points than what I was taught in school because let's be honest his story anyways the lost battalion I'm excited to check this out be sure to drop a like be sure to subscribe if you aren't already subscribed and let's get into it and I'm Joachim from Sabaton and this is Sabaton history and we are standing in the Argonne forest where the lost Woo! it's in uh French man no 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 this needs to be in English all right here we go there we go. Much better. The battalion was lost during the First World War. So let's find out more, shall we? Oh, man. The Argonne is rough terrain. Rocky hills and thick woodland. And it had been in German hands since the end of 1914. Now, in late September 1918, mm. the Argonne was an important part of the strongest German position, the Hagenstellung. And as the Allies finally began to break through, it comes down to the Americans to push through that fortified maze of bushes and ravines. But the American forces had hardly any experience in this terrain, especially not the 77th Division. That division was mostly from New York, and they were Ooh. former street kids, <laughs> baseball players, thugs, gamblers, clerks, gangsters, shoemakers, bouncers, everything. And many were recent immigrants, men with Irish, German, Polish, or Russian. See, that was a note that I was going to mention right there, is we see all in the European conflicts, I mean, they're honestly fighting in beautiful, beautiful trade. You're extremely beautiful, and then we have a lot of these wars, and like he's, you know, mentioning is you have city boys from New York. I mean, they're dealing with the slums, they're gangbangers, they're gamblers, they're, you know, they're alcoholics, whatever it may be, and then you're sending them to these trains. Woo! Woo! Man. Russian heritage, <laughs> Catholics, oh. Protestants, and Jews. They were the most mixed bunch you could imagine. And yep. just before they were shipped out to France in April 1918, they had been bolstered with men from the Midwest. They were truly an all American division. The Meuse Argonne Offensive Man. had been making progress. And despite heavy casualties, the Americans advanced several miles towards the Germans. By the end of September, the 77th Division stood deep in enemy territory. But progress was still way too slow for high command's liking. And orders came to keep up the pace. As long as the official casualty list was still comparatively low, there was no need to stop. Hmm. But for the men on the ground, this was easier said than done. Major Charles Whittlesey, in command of nine companies of the 77th, complained to General Alexander, in overall command, that their flanks were constantly exposed, as the French forces on the left and the 308th Regiment on the right were not keeping up with them. That was indeed a major problem, because once inside the forest, it was easy to lose track of time and direction. Since they had no wireless radio, they had to rely on maps and compasses. Time and again, they had been surprised by hidden German machine gun posts, and German infiltration teams were constantly trying to outflank mm. companies yes. that went too far ahead. More than once, Whittlesey's companies had lost contact with the forces on their flanks, right? General Alexander gave the strict order. They were to go forwards, not backwards. Major Whittlesey wholeheartedly disagreed with Alexander, and he knew the reality of frontline combat better, but there was no point in arguing. So early on the morning of October 2nd, mm. Whittlesey's battalion of roughly 550 men entered the forest, behind a creeping barrage where the German trenches were believed to be. As they marched forward, though, they noticed that the enemy was strangely silent. Here and there, terrified young boys and exhausted old men in dirty German uniforms came their way, surrendering without a fight. And hopes were high that Germany was finally coming to the end of its fighting capability, and breakthrough was close at hand. But once again, hidden machine guns and mortars opened up on them. Yet there was no continuous German line, just small nests of resistance. They pushed on until the evening and reached the top of a ravine where they suddenly stood... 
I mean, the title's The Lost Battalion, so that could be left up to interpretation. But at the same time, I mean, how creepy is that? You're kind of, you know, you're, you're intensified in World War One's extremely barbaric in the approach. I mean, it's basically two guys in two separate trenches shooting at each other and probably calling each other names. And then you're going through this forest trying to find these individuals. You have different units surrendering. And then you have pockets of resistance of the same people that you're fighting sporadically. So it's got to be that, like, unique, just uncomfortable you know situation that they had to experience and Stood this is getting better a Ooh. major german strong point but one without a single german soldier in sight hmm. maybe general alexander had been right all along maybe the germans were truly it's broken and in full retreat major whittlesey ordered his men to move along though he had not heard from the commanders on his flanks for quite a while what he could not know was that the Germans were by no means broken. He had simply found a hole in their front line. The French and the 308 had made only little progress, and the only ones really pushing forward right now were Whittlesey's nine companies, and the Germans were about to notice. So he's basically getting set up for a massive ambush. I mean, he's pushing through a line that just the force was so dense. You know, probably the Germans even had that confusion of like where they needed to establish their men because i mean base i've never been here but the way it's being described is making me interpret that the forest was extremely thick and dense and just you know you can't you didn't really know what was going on so i mean I, i'm picturing it as they're going in like this you have these two other divisions kind of sputtering along and the germans can kind of just come in and next thing you know just pop tough spot to be in Mm. By nightfall, the battalion had dug in on the side of a hill, and they arranged their machine guns around the perimeter. Major Whittlesey was then told that the men had heard German voices back from where they came. As daylight found them, so too did the German mortars. Whittlesey had around 500 men fit for action and had still heard nothing from his flanks. He sent out runners, and they thought they spotted German soldiers moving through the bushes. Now, Whittlesey had seen that before, the German infiltration tactics. Oh. So he sent out his strongest company, E Company. But were they really Germans out there or friendly runners trying to reestablish connection? A voice came from the bushes. Americans, it asked. A private replied, yes, E Company. The response to that was a hail of hand grenades and machine gun fire. E Company was no more. The Germans had found them, and Whittlesey's worst fears had come true. He was cut off, yep. and not even his carrier pigeons seemed able to find their way. And the German artillery was getting closer. Whittlesey was in a tight spot. He could pull back and make a break for the American lines. But he had a lot of wounded, and going back would mean leaving them out in the open. He also had no idea how many Germans were there. He chose to stay. Hmm. The Germans tested them rushing from cover to cover, baiting the Americans to fire at them and reveal their positions. And German mortars caused heavy casualties. But the Americans had an advantage. They had German immigrants in their ranks who understood the carelessly shouted German commands. This foiled attacks until night fell. Hmm. The pocket was shrinking, but still held. The water and food were running out fast. On the third day, water and food had run out and the men resorted to searching German corpses for food. Whittlesey and the other officers did their best to keep up morale, and in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of France, the New Yorker attitude still came through. Every German attack was met with defiance, and every insult was promptly <laughs> returned. The 77s would not be cowed and would not give up. In the afternoon, the shelling intensified mm. and crept dangerously close. Then it finally hit their positions. Huge artillery shells rained down on them, and it became clear that it was American artillery. Whittlesey hurried to his birds. You know, the part that I love is <clears throat> how he mentions the New Yorker attitude. And you hear stories, you know, about how in World War II, the mafia actually guarded the naval docks and this and that. And then, you know, I have family members from New York and seeing that attitude and, you know, in person and then hearing it. It's just that, st that stubborn, you know, 
heavily influenced by immigrant accent or excuse me, uh, personality where it's like, no, this is what we're going to do, man. And we're going to do it. <laughs> and, oh man. Oh, history, man. <laughs> None had returned. There's only one left. The handler's favorite, a black and white pigeon called Cher Ami. Whittlesey wrote, our oh, own man. artillery is dropping a barrage directly on us. For heaven's sake, stop it. And his coordinates on a piece of paper, put it in an aluminum tube and bound it to the bird's leg. All their hopes lay with this bird and Cher Ami took off to the next tree where she sat peacefully on a oh, branch gosh. watching the men who kicked the tree and threw stones at the bird until she took wing again. The shelling continued and even got worse as the Germans joined in. Soon, German soldiers were breaking into the pocket, hurling grenades as they came down the slope. Oh my now, gosh. <laughs> had they intended oh gosh. to kill all of the Americans, they would probably have succeeded, but instead they tried to take prisoners. This gave the battalion a chance to fight back. Machine guns ran hot. Soldiers fired at point-blank range from a wall of corpses, resisting capture once more, forcing the Germans to retreat. And night fell once hmm. again. Oh, man. Can you imagine that? Like, seriously, this is the definition of could anything get possibly worse? I mean, you're already pushed up as a division and company. Um, excuse me, I, or battalion. You're pushed up in a battalion through the lines basically the way i envision is the enemy's kind of encircling you right now and they're in front of you it's almost like a circle you know and they're kind of entrapping you you're getting shelled by your own guys because they are unaware of how far you've pushed because they're assuming the line's pretty consistent which you know let's be honest that makes sense and then on top of that your prize carrier pigeon which imagine trusting your entire life on a carrier pigeon decides to sit up in a tree he wants to hang out and he's just looking at you like what's up Steve how's it going bro oh man man honestly the phrase the great war really makes sense because of what these individuals had to go through and soldiers and these type of conflicts like I mean just some of these stories are incredible you know and obviously you know based off what I was taught in history my own collective knowledge and learning is World War II is definitely a little bit more of a prominent role because it influenced a lot more where we are now you know and granted that's because it's been like 70 something years versus World War One to World War Two was about you know 20 years so there's a difference but I mean hearing some of these stories are just absolutely intense Unknown to them, their story was getting attention. At first, politically, both American and German high commands knew that the destruction of the pocket would be a propaganda coup. The Germans could boast how superior their troops were, and the Americans would face political backlash back at home, and maybe even be taken out of the line. Both sides increased efforts to find them. As morning broke on the fourth day, Whittlesey and his men had no food, little ammo, and most of their machine guns were destroyed. The artillery barrage came back, but this time, it did not hit their position. Instead, falling on the Germans further north, Cher Ami had found its way to the American headquarters. With a shrapnel wound and a leg blown off, oh, she had wow. still given their coordinates to headquarters. So now, American command knew where they were, but still didn't know their situation. In fact, Alexander was writing out orders that Whittlesey should resume the attack northwards. The Germans made plans to finally destroy the pocket. The next night, several groups of veteran stormtroops appeared at the front, ready to move in, but this time they would not take prisoners. Day five. At midday came panic shouts. Liquid fire sprayed mm. the position and a shower of grenades fell. German flamethrowers came down the slope while from the flanks, stormtroops tore through the bushes. A violent melee began. Engulfed in smoke and flames, the pocket turned into a no-holds-barred brawl to the death. The Americans engaged the stormtroops with knives clubs and bayonets officers fired their revolvers at point-blank range no quarter was given no mercy was shown and the americans held barely but they held mm -hmm. the sixth day of combat began the men were exhausted mentally and physically 
The mood now was fatalistic, and mm. many wrote their final letters, not expecting to come out of this alive. But the Germans sent in a letter of their own, asking for surrender. Whittlesey made clear there would huh. be no surrender. Mm -hmm. High command had sent out volunteers to establish contact. Many were intercepted by the Germans, but some eventually broke through and came in contact with the rest of the 77th Division, trying to fight its way through to the Lost Battalion. Finally, on the 8th of October, after seven days of combat, the Lost Battalion was found. Finally! Oh my gosh, that's, that's intense. Like, in those seven days, it must have felt like a... Eternity. I mean, it's constant barrage, battling, you know, you're going from basically a little less violent combat where the Germans are a little more focused on taking prisoners to extreme intense hand-to-hand -hand combat. You know, we, we've seen trench warfare, you know, most of us are familiar with it if we've been, you know, following history of just the intensity. And to finally be found, like, the extra morale boost and, oh my gosh, like, that's just... Oh my gosh, this is intense. Food and water were rushed into the exhausted men. From the 554 men that went in, 197 were killed, and 150 were either missing or captured by the enemy. Only 194 men walked out of the pocket under their own steam, hmm. but most of them were wounded. Nearly overnight, it became the biggest American story of the war. War reporters rushed into the scene and immediately interviewed the men, which is why we have such a detailed account of the fighting. Major Charles Whittlesey and two other captains would receive the Medal of Honor for their wow. actions, and Cher Ami was even awarded the Croix de Guerre. But all of the men had become heroes to the American public, and stories and books were written about them. They really became the all-American heroes of the war. And to this day, books, films, and songs are written about them hmm. and their stand as they have entered the realm of American legends. You know what's crazy about this? This being, you know, American battalion and everything is, mindfully, I don't recall the, the learning about this battalion. Now, granted, I may have learned it and I just forgot because, let's be honest, there's so much crap that you can learn. And there's just a lot of wisdom and knowledge, especially about these different wars. There's just so much information. But mindfully, I have not learned about the Lost Battalion. Uh, okay, Lost Battalion, the song. What do you got? Nothing. Uh, now, this is an interesting idea for a Sabaton song. How did you how did you come up with the idea in the first place? Well, you know, over the years, we've asked our fans from all over the world to give us ideas, send us emails or give us books and such. And this one is actually one of those stories. Okay. Uh, many years back, a friend named Mike gave us a book called The Lost Battalion, actually. So you guys do actually go through, like when, you know, when people send you books and things, you, you, you do actually read them. And, and yes, so. I mean, not everything, obviously. We get a lot of books, but everything that we think looks interesting and can be inspiration for a song. Over the years, I don't know how many thousands of emails we have got. Yeah. And I can honestly say we have read everyone, and they're all saved, except when you suggested Star Wars or such. Okay, well, when they do their album Star Wars, we'll have to be on location huh? for that, too. Yes. You can write in and ask if you want us on the ice planet Hoth or on the desert planet oh, Tatooine oh. when we film the Star Wars ones, because those will be fun to do. Yeah, but it'll be far, far away. But we know there's a <laughs> cantina where we can get drinks. Oh, uh, yes, that's good. Uh, before I forget, I'll tell you what. Um, in the description, there'll be a link to that book so that yep. anybody... Because you said it was good, yeah? Very good. And it inspired the song. Yes. Now, what about the song itself? Is it a, just a traditional, straightforward sabotage? No, song? this is very different. Uh, this one actually actually has a new drum kit that isn't real. I had this idea and I had it for many, many years, but I never, it was never turned into a reality until now. Okay. And uh, the kick drum yeah. is a machine gun. Okay. The snare oh. drum is a nine millimeter handgun. Yeah. And <laughs> this is kind of macabre, but the, the hi-hat is a bayonet going into flesh. Can we, can we hear some of that right now? All right, obviously that's kind of gory, you know, but that is a cool setup. That is a very cool setup. It's a unique way to add the drum elements into the song. Ah, 
Oh, there it is. All right, there we are. See, I love that when that happens. <laughs> yes. I can also call down thunder. Never mind. Um, <laughs> no, but it's really uh, this idea I had for a long time. And sound production-wise, it's a nightmare, you know? Yeah. So I basically took the sounds of these machine guns, uh, nine millimeter guns and everything, and I tested everything. Yeah. And I built, obviously, this is computer-based samples, but I built mm. a drum kit out of, well, sounds of death, I guess. But that, I guess, it will bring home what these guys were actually facing. I mean, they're there for days. They're, they're under fire, not just from, from the Germans, under fire from their own guys. Yeah, and it's, uh, from that point of view, it's really one of my favorite things because finally a um, crazy idea I had actually worked actually out. Worked out. <laughs> now, um, I can't help but ask, uh, how are you going to do that live? We have done it live a couple of times, actually. With stabbing someone the bayonets repeatedly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually, yeah. It's probably oh. smacking them up, you know. Oh, yeah. Okay. They go, ow, 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 ow. Yes. Just wow. the bayonet noise. That's yes. all we want. <laughs> we need to be quiet. No, but we uh, actually for that, we, Hannes is playing it live, but yeah. uh, it's triggered by uh, samples. Okay. So, so he's, like uh, yeah, we have tr triggers on the drums. So when, when he's punching everything, uh, it's still the sample drums we hear. We mix them with uh, acoustic drums, so it's a mix there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's played live because we mm. don't want to put it on a drum machine when we have an awesome drummer, you know. Well, that's absolutely true. <laughs> All right. Oh man, I'm gonna finish this strong. We got like some minutes. All right, everybody. Um, that was Lost Battalion from The Last Stand, which came out a couple years ago. All right, looks like he is ending it for me. But anyways, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna be reacting to The Lost Battalion. Be sure to check that out. Stay tuned. It is coming your guys' way. If you reach this point, thank you. Thank you so much for watching. Please, 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 please be sure to subscribe. Most of you guys who watch this video, you do not subscribe, but you guys are extremely interested in Sabaton. And guess what? I do quite a bit of Sabaton on this channel. Anyways, as always, stay healthy, stay happy, and have a blessed day. Peace.